what relationship do you think that that has with um, these observational studies that have found that these drugs also seem to possibly play a preventative role for conditions like Alzheimer's disease? And um, I mean, I know that they were originally designated to be... Heart disease. Yeah. Pulmonary like, hypertension. Yeah. yeah, to treat hypertension, which is a major modifiable risk factor for <laughs> dementia. Right. Um, so, it, so it actually makes sense. But is nitric oxide related in any way to that observation, do you think? Absolutely. I mean, it's all about blood flow. So dementia, we call it vascular dementia because there's a vascular component, meaning that the blood vessels of the cerebral arteries are clamped down and constricted, and there's reduced blood flow to the prefrontal cortex. So those of people, and the, 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 the good and the bad of the PD-5 inhibitors is they're not unique to the vascular bed of the sex organs. They're dilating all blood vessels. That's why sometimes people get a headache if they take those drugs. So it's dilating blood vessels all over. So it's improving blood flow to the brain, to the liver, to the heart, to the kidneys, to the sex organs. And so when you can restore blood flow to any organ, that organ's going to work better. Hmm. So it, it's really, to, for me, chronic disease is all about blood flow. So if you can get oxygen and nutrients into the cell and you can activate the energy production capacity of that cell and you have good enough circulation where you can take out the metabolic waste products, then there's no inflammation, there's no oxidative stress, there's no immune dysfunction, and you don't get misfolding of protein. Hmm. Are you a fan of cocoflavanols? Yeah, look, there's there's pretty significant data, published data on that. But these are the epicatechins in the cocoflavanols. It's a certain class of flavanols. But those can stimulate and activate nitric oxide production only if the enzyme is active. Hmm. Right, so in I think all the published studies, they're taking young, healthy individuals with good endothelial function, and you give them the cocoflavanols, and you see an improvement in nitric oxide production because they, their body's able to make it. But if in older people, people with endothelial dysfunction, where the enzyme is not active to make nitric oxide, those have no effect. Got it. Okay, so how do we? So this is all downstream still. Of, yeah. So how do we get then to the like? Let's swim upstream. Yeah, that's where we've been for the past 25 years. Yeah, so what do, so I mean is it just about like eating more beets and arugula or like how do we so how do we boost I guess the raw materials required for nitric oxide synthesis in our bodies? To answer that question, you first have to ask what are the pathways to make nitric oxide? How does the human body produce nitric oxide? And once you understand mechanistically how the body makes it, then you can own, then and only then can you understand how do we promote it and prevent the loss of it. So there's two ways. One is this enzyme, the nitric oxide synthase that's found in the lining of the blood vessels. That enzyme converts arginine to nitric oxide. And so you've probably seen all the nitric oxide-based products out there. So, But the basis of the deficiency is not a lack of L-arginine. So arginine and citrulline products are useless. Your body makes enough of these amino acids to, to do the job. The problem is the enzyme becomes dysfunctional okay. and it's due to glycation so too much sugar sugar sticks and sticks these molecules together uh, the other is an uh, kind of a oxidant rich kind of inflammatory diet leads to oxidative stress and it uncouples the enzyme uh, sedentary lifestyle and it's really the american diet and then things like you know drug therapy whether it's antacids uh, cholesterol lowering medication um you know, those are the big ones. And mouthwash, which we've talked yeah, about. Yeah, so that was the first path. So then on the other the other pathway, we get it from the diet, right? Things like beets, arugula, spinach, nitrate-rich vegetables. We consume those, but nitrate is inert in humans. Humans don't have the functional genetic capacity to metabolize nitrate. So we're 100% dependent upon the oral bacteria. So we can eat beets, arugula all day long, but if we're using mouthwash or we have fluoride in our toothpaste or drinking water then nitrate is excreted in your sweat and your urine and your feces, um, and it's without effect. So you don't get the effects of the vegetables if you don't have the right oral bacteria. Should we be pulling fluoride out of the municipal water? Suppose? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Like one of the bad things, one of the bad things of, of fluoride is it's inhibiting nitric oxide production. The other thing, which is apparent now, is it's lowering IQ in kids. It s destroys your thyroid function. Because most Americans don't have enough iodine to convert T4 to T3, and fluoride is a halogen, so it competes with binding to, with iodine for fluoride. So it causes hypothyroidism. I mean, we have a pandemic of hypothyroidism, and it's a neurotoxin. Mm. Go buy some rat poison on the back. It says sodium fluoride. 
I mean, that's rat poison. Wow. I didn't know that they use that for rat poison. Yeah. And then look at the back of a fluoride toothpaste. It's got, if you swallow this, here's the number for poison control. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You know, you've seen that? Damn. I mean, people don't, if people paid attention and knew the consequences of what they were putting in and on their body, I mean, we would have a much different outlook on health and would have a much healthier population. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there.